the Third Age Babylon 5 podcast. Today we're discussing um, the episode In the Shadow of Zahadum. And uh, of course, before we jump in the discussion, we have another introduction question. And uh, today we thought we go way back and um, introduce our most favorite childhood video games. So who wants to start? Well, I have to start. Well, I'm most interested in your answer. All right. So maybe it's an embarrassing answer. I don't know, or an outdated one. Or it's an answer that shows that I was actually not allowed to play that many video games because my mother thought they were harmful in any way. But what I was allowed to was to play on the Nintendo GameCube that my father somehow smuggled into the household. And then it was there. And I had all the first three Harry Potter games. And I just loved running around in Hogwarts and exploring this world that I had fallen in love with through the books. And it's, it's, it's tough to decide which one I like the most, but I think my favorite one was the third one from the whole um, art design and music. And um, yeah, so it's my favorite because it's also the only one that I was allowed to play as a child. But yeah. Um, for me, it's it's a tough decision because I I was allowed to play a few more than than you, I believe. But right now, I would I would uh, I would call Chris Sawyer's Locomotion simply because that's you know, one of many old tycoon games that I enjoyed playing, and I still do. I've recently gotten it back on Steam, and now on on my commutes, I I spend my time with it, so it really held up, which is great. Well, for me, it's not the the first uh, video game I played because that would have been uh, Pokemon. Um, for me, my favorite uh, childhood video game would be Final Fantasy VIII um, because I, I can't really explain it. I just love the, the story, the gameplay. Um, it, it was the first uh, one from the Final Fantasy series that I played. Um, and well, I, I also got a PlayStation um, to play it, which, which was really awesome because, uh, well, my parents weren't so eager for me playing video games um, either, but for some reason they decided, okay, we, we get her that uh, before she just runs off a place at someone else's house. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that was, was my get to a game, uh, which I still play from time to time. Both of you are just console kids, and it shows you turned out terribly because your parents slipped up. It's 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 a real problem. Oh, actually, can can I mention something else? No. Because for some funny reason, I also I don't know how that happened, but I also had a Game Boy Color, and I played Tetris. Oh, I don't even know how to say that in English. Bina Maya. I don't even know if that thing is internationally it's translated. But it's a it's an animated TV show from the seventies, I think, about a little bee and insects, and it's super cute. And the Game Boy Color had a version. Oh, didn't know that. Super cute. Oh, I, I have it here. No, I guess I have to come to play. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you will finally beat it. I finished it. Yes, but she didn't. <laughs> Funny thing though, even you say I started as a as a console kid, I r really quickly strayed away from that and turned to a PC kid because yeah, it, it was just far more simpler and way more achievable for um, for me to play on a PC than on um, yeah on on a console because well, I didn't have the money for that. It's much easier to gear up for the PC ones. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, back from our childhood to um, Babylon 5 and the In the Shadow of Zahadun. Uh, I think the, the most important part is we have Morden sitting in a cell, sort of. Uh, we have um, the Ministry of Peace coming to Babylon 5 the first time. Um, and, well, a few things are getting revealed without telling what exactly it is. I think this is about it, what's happening. Oh, maybe um, one of the, the, the yeah, revelations um, should be announced um, because it's so important for Sheridan because it's about his wife and her death or, well, the sort of killing 
well, yeah, that's that's like what's up happening in this episode. And I have to say, just directly jumping into first exp- um, impressions, um, this was it, um, in, in contrast to the last episode we discussed. This episode was really for me. Oh, I yeah. Now now the real shit is going to to start, and I really had to hold back not to uh, watch another episode for the next podcast. Um, I mean, a lot of the recent episodes and and now forward especially were a kind of settling into the status quo. This one isn't doing that. None of the things that are happening on the station are status quo. So it's it's really moving things along. How was your first impression? I mean, I mean uh, many people remember that I keep saying we're getting closer, we're getting closer to the point where I when I watched it for the all for the very first time where I was hooked by I said I have to finish this show. We're getting closer and it shows. So yeah, it's a very enjoyable episode. With the two main plots uh, like like Mike already lined out, do we have a favorite? Do we have a place where we want to start? I would say let's start with the um, well less prominent one or the the, the smaller one um, to get a soft um, entrance here uh, with the Ministry of Peace or as they like to call themselves the Mini Packs. It's an adorable oh. nickname. That's always a good sign. Yeah, yeah, yes. And the first thing for me was that the the name Pax really hard ring for me uh, because I had Latin in school. <laughs> it was horrible. I hated it. Um, well, French wouldn't have been any better, but um, yes, and I I really had really strong school vibes in this moment because one of the things uh, that were discussed in the texts we had to translate was the Pax Romana, um, the Roman peace. And yeah, the idea of a peace uh, in this contrast uh, or context is, yeah, with a really, really bad side taste because there, there were still people suffering, um, slaves were traded and and anything else going on and um i'm, I'm not sure about the the uh, the english uh, words for this but it was always um the the translations or if they are the the um the um other yeah barbaric people were conquered it was like we bring peace to them uh, which was a really arrogant way of, yeah, we teach them our way and this is the only way they're allowed to live, um, which just goes all the way through um, history and uh, no matter where you uh, take a look um, at, yeah, one country uh, conquering the other. So, yeah, and then when they start with their... Um, yeah, well, it it feels a bit like the the space version of a TED talk. Very much so. Just getting a hall somewhere and giving some motivational speeches. Yeah, and when he started, um, I, I forgot the guy's name, but I don't think it matters at least at this point. Uh, when he was like, "Oh yeah," and the problem is is our ideas and stuff like that. The problem is that you sit there. Yeah, basically, you're right. The problem, what you're trying to do here is, um, yeah, well, it gave me really strong Stasi vibes. That's a good point, because what I first had in mind when I heard this Ministry of Peace thing was that, <clears throat> to me, it, it, it felt uh, like an Orwell reference to 1984, where the whole society is also controlled by the Ministry of Peace, the Ministry of Truth, and the Ministry of, what is the third one? I always forget that. Uh, four law from Sandy, but whatever. I read it years ago. It was not so long ago when we watched it for the first time. So yeah, that was always what I was thinking. And um, it's actually interesting because um, 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 this is not, for me, the only reference to this oral work, actually, but I think that the show has a completely different spin on these topics, and I think we will talk about that later because it it has a much more open and a much more, a much more um, I think, a much more 
much more different perspectives on these topics that in our world are very straightforward. But also, I think maybe that's the point to say that um, what I find interesting now that we talked about that reference a little bit is that the set design in some shots reminds me a lot of the Orwell version that I think was from 1984, from the years. It's the one with John, with John Hurt. There are many versions. It's the one where John Hurt is our main character. Um, and that is just an interesting thing to talk about in the end, I think, to discuss that and review that on why do we have these references and uh, what what differences are there? What do they actually tell us about these topics? Like, because he said Stasi, like um, about, about, um, about, about to tell, to tell, to tell, to 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 about totalitarian regimes, about authority, about freedom of speech, of thought, because there are differences. But yeah, that's interesting to discuss. So it's definitely a big, a big thing that they're opening up with the mini packs here. Yeah. Maybe a short explanation what, um, yeah, Stasi means for us. Or maybe Alex, I don't really want to do this because you're way more better than when, uh, with explaining these things. I drew for off family after. history, um, in <laughs> Staatssicherheit in the sense of state security service, which, you know, is, is a big thing in Eastern Germany, but anybody vaguely familiar with the Soviet Union in general, like every member state basically had some version of this, which is just an internal, uh, yeah, security service of sorts, which is in, in, in charge of making sure that everybody is online and especially the Stasi was notorious for its note keeping and really getting into families of like turning people against each other and having very elaborate uh, schemes of like listening devices and such. People often joke about how mad Stasi would be nowadays just knowing how much information people willingly give up when they so painstakingly tried collecting it and now it's just a like little box that you click when you make your Facebook profile and there it all goes. But also that kind of shows because these information are so available nowadays that also their world is a completely different one than back then. I think. Yes. But that's another discussion, of course. Um, maybe what I found interesting about this reference is that that in Babylon 5 always gives us this this huge uh, perspective really from, from... You can always jump outside of the perspective that you would have just, just an Earth citizen, just an Mumbai citizen, because mm. you 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 have the, in the universe at least these opportunities or also as a viewer to, to, to be in this place where all of these different mindsets um, um, meet. And you also always are on this level of, I'm talking to someone who comes from a totally different culture, totally different system, and I still often have a common ground. And I think what I found interesting about the 1984 reference in respect to the Stasi reference as well is that 1984 is a novel that is written stating that these methods of this state security thing can completely undermine our humanity. You can completely control our society by that and there is no way out. If this regime is built up globally, it's over. And that is just a, that's a hypothesis for the novel that I would say is that's not really it's not that simple. And I think Babylon Pipe also makes interesting points on that, but that is something we can talk about at a later point. I think by its very nature, it's also not presented as this all-encompassing thing because it can't be because the universe of Babylon 5 is so much bigger. But as we're already talking about this, I, I like the reference especially to some of the movie versions of 1984 because it's interesting that they build Babylon 5 like the show and it's this very colorful 90s show very stylized with all these fun aliens and such but then if you rearrange the set just a little bit and then you just invite a crowd of humans that are selected from the state of the security service and such you very quickly get this like homogenous human crowd in gray jumpsuits which very quickly resembles the completely dystopian feel that a lot of these movie versions are going for that and also just the design of, of, of the conference room, for example, or also of the hallway on the station, these, how the gray walls are built with just one colorful um, uh, um, outlining outlining in the middle. That is a direct reference, I think, to the set design in the Yeast 1984 version that I'm talking about um, when we meet government officials and are inside of one of the ministries. I mm. think it's the Ministry of Truth. It has been a while. But that is a direct reference to these rooms. Yeah. 
And I think it's it's just nice to see that, or well, not nice, but it's interesting to see that this shines through so quickly because we are getting introduced to the mini packs in this episode for the very first time. And I think we can all agree, it's, it's a big deal that they are doing something like this. But at the same time, it's not like Sheridan or Ivanova are sitting here like dumbstruck and also saying, oh my God, it's like 1984. This is what they always warned us about. This is terrible. Like, this is something that happens in this universe and is seen as relatively normal. Yeah, but let's maybe talk about the security guy who takes it for a little bit too normal. Let's talk about <laughs> Zack if you want to, uh, unless yeah. unless you want to start with, with something else. No, no, um, Zack is, uh, is a perfect starting point. Um, in the beginning of this episode, I was like... Oh yeah, we get to see some more time of from with with Zach, and uh, so far I I really liked him uh, appearing. And then at that point where he in the end stands there with with its um yeah what what was the with a little what, armband yeah and uh, like yeah and I thought why not the, the on on one hand okay we we get to know earlier that history wasn't his cu cup of tea. Uh, when um, there is this reference from from uh, Sheridan to to Second World War and Enigma and stuff, um, but where where you think, okay, if he wasn't sleeping in history class all the time, he may have had an idea in this moment that this is not necessarily a good idea. But overall, the whole thing starts. Yeah, with with what I what I already said, it sounds logical, uh, and and it's the the um, the point that um, ideas can get or, or thoughts can get dangerous. Is in itself not a, not nothing wrong. The problem is what are they doing um, to yeah kind of control this, um, and that's that's where it, it it gets problematic because it's. Like, okay, we tell you what you are allowed to say to the thing to do, um, which is also the reason why Talia is there. Um, recommended from, yeah, her really lovely friends. Um, yeah, oh, yes. she, it's like she, she feels, I mean, I, I think with, with her face expression, you, you get, okay, she is seeing through all of this. And I mean, of course, since she knows, who um, recommended her? She is is um, yeah careful um, from from the beginning, um, but you can think that the rest of people that are there come from the same direction as as maybe Zach, not knowing, um, being easily manipulated just with yeah a little bit more of money. Um, and of course, on the other side, people that would say, yeah, that's, that's right. We have to do this. I think a big part, and I, I would love to talk about Talia's interaction separately because there are some interesting threads in there as well. But I, I think a big part of this is also that these people are a bit further removed and we obviously look at this and see what the end game of mini packs looks like but because it's starting so mellow and with so many fundamentally just okay ideas it's v relatively easy to make an argument why somebody like zach would look at that and say well as long as it's just what they're presenting in this ted talk here i don't see anything wrong with that it's just we look at this knowing it's a tv show having the history much more present and maybe being in an overall political climate that is a little bit more sensitive to this thing. And we say, well, yeah, but this is only this and that many steps removed from being something much worse. But there's no indicator necessarily for, for somebody like Zach to say, well, that's inevitably what's going to happen. And a lot of the points that the mini packs guy does are at least on the surface very logical. It was something like this idea, hey, before we go out and tell all these other species how to make peace, maybe we should be at peace with ourselves. Like that's that's an argument that everybody makes at any point. It's very sensible. Yes, but what you also have to think about when you see someone like Zach, I think in this episode, he was not just, um, or I think Garibaldi did not just resign to make the plot more engaging with Zach. I think they also wanted to show two different 
ways of dealing with authority because you can never escape authority. You always have someone above yourself that you have to respond to. And we, we have we have laws to, to follow. You, you're never free of authority and that's okay. But you have different ways of dealing with it. And if you're not okay with something, someone above you asks of you. There are people who resign their job and leave, like Garibaldi, obviously. And then there's someone like Zach who is just, I would say, I would even call it a little bit naive, who just looks at Sheridan and thinks like, okay, I'll follow your orders because I have total trust in you. We're the good guys, right? But it's also this thing where, this is where I love that these two plots are paired here because Sheridan, uh, to just very briefly uh, glance at that uh, other big plot, Sheridan is not playing things by the book. Sheridan is bending the letter of the law to suit himself. And we've watched Sinclair and Sheridan do that for one and a half seasons and we've cheered them on because that's great if, you know, the government wants to cut the budget and he finds a way, a loophole in the regulations to make that not happen. That's really Yeah, cool. but you're confusing things here, I think. Because it's different to find a loophole in the regulations and to just go against the regulations directly as having someone in custody without having without having any charges that are too different. I will go get to that. I, like, I'm not arguing against you immediately. You don't have to be this defensive about it. I'm just saying I like that we see Sheridan do something that isn't so far removed from what we've seen other people do. And we can just say, very rightly so, there is a line somewhere in between where it stops being okay. But it's understandable that somebody like, like Zach might draw this line just a little bit more here or a little bit more over there. So that, at least for me as a viewer, it becomes a lot more understandable why this is such a big issue. And, you know, I why it's conflicting for me to watch this episode because I look at Sheridan through this episode and I really sympathize with him. I I can completely get where he's coming from. I also get where Garibaldi is coming from resigning then, although I have questions whether or not that's really the best idea of dealing with a system that's getting massively corrupt. It's just kind of saying, well, I'm not going to be part of this and step away for somebody else to take your place. Like it also illustrates why that might be a problem. And you know, somebody like Ivanova, who is having some very strong words with Sheridan, but ultimately doesn't do everything she can to 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 resolve the situation. So, I I think it's 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 giving you this example. Before you um, keep on going, maybe um, to go um, back to to uh, Garibaldi and and Zach and their let's say motivations, um, because. I'm I'm not sure why they are doing what they are doing. Um, on one hand, Gary Baldy is saying, "Yeah, I um, I when I'm outside, I play it the way I want to, but here I play it by the book." He doesn't really say why he is doing this. Mm -hmm. Is it, is he doing this to to um, stay safe, to keep his job, um, or yeah, or or to to. Is, is, is there a higher motivation? Is there something he wants to achieve? Um, and that, that's a bit problematic for, for me because I don't know why he is playing by the book. Um, on the other hand, uh, therefore, I, I do also don't know really why he is quitting. Mm. Of course, he's saying I can't do, um, yeah, I, I can't do it uh, the way you're doing it, Sheridan. But the question is, why not? Of course, he's saying, yeah, it's my head that's um, on the line here. So is it just to save himself or to protect himself? Or is there, again, something more? Um, if I think about Zach, I'm not sure if it's if I would call it um, the naivety of, of trust. Like, yeah, you, you know what you will do. Um, it's Maybe it's just like, um, it, it's just over over way over his head um to to make this kind of decision i mean there are people that are able to make yeah tough decisions and then there are people that just can't for whatever it is that is preventing them from it if it's the intelligence if it's their ability um to to yeah wrap up everything that is connected to some um to a point so of course, we have two different, um, 
yeah, persons with, with characteristics here. Um, but I can't really say what it is exactly that makes, uh, makes them so different because I don't, I, I'm, I can't see their motivation. Mm. Yes, that's a bit difficult. I mean, you, for example, said about Black that he may just draw the line at a different level. Um, for me, at this point, not knowing what is happening next, I'm not sure if he, will, if he even is a person who draws the line at some point or if he, if he just follows blindly. follows blindly and has this naive trust or if he at some point realizes, oh, fuck, this is all wrong. Um, or if he just doesn't even consider that. I don't know it at this point, definitely. Or doesn't care. Or doesn't or care. And for me, uh, actually, that's maybe also something I should mention because always when he says that with his slang, with his kind of speaking, yeah, I slept through history class. He's just, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit like a caricature, actually, of a certain yeah. kind of people. I, it always makes me laugh with tears in my eyes, but laugh. Uh, but I mean, this this touches on I, I guess why I also am so quick to look at the this, the past seasons and and draw this comparison, even though this situation is taken to another extreme. What we've seen for all of these characters is that they live in a world, and I think this is what makes Babylon Five special. They live in a world where it's always been the case that there is a system and that's flawed, and you survive by trusting that certain people in positions of power will make the right decision at some point. And if they wouldn't do that, the liberties they are taking, the ways they are bending the rules would be very highly problematic. You know, this is where you have somebody like Sinclair, where I really like that he's reusing funds in his own way because he wants to help the union, but the same level of liberty could also be used to massively get just corrupt and rich on the side, which would be yes. a massive problem. And it's... Uh, <laughs> I, I think this is where, you know, I then also get into this into this mindset. I have a flawed system and I have to trust people that they do the right call. And I look at somebody like Sheridan and I'm fairly confident that he is going to make the right call under the right circumstances. This is why this episode is shocking. I look at somebody like Garibaldi and I might think, well, he says he's playing things by the book in his office, but... I don't really know why, and that makes me uncomfortable. That's not that. That's not a good thing. And I look at somebody like uh, Zach, and very rightly might say, "I don't know if he's gonna make the right call, not because he's evil, but he might just not notice in time, and that's a big problem." And I, yeah, this is this is what makes things very interesting about Babylon Five for me because it shows you how important and big the systems are, but at the same time also puts so much emphasis on the individual that is part of the system. Yes, this just reminds me of discussions that I've often had in history class in school, of course, and also with friends a bit after, after even in, in university settings still, because, um, for example, an, um, an interpretation that I often learned in school still about, about for example, um, the beginnings of World War II was that the, the constitution that the Weimar Republic had just had some fundamental flaws, and we have now... We have now cleaned up these flaws, <laughs> so that could not happen again. And that, of course, is not 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 correct. Um, be, and um, we always got to the point of there is no completely safe system. You never ha can have a completely a safety um, against against these turning points or against these disasters. So you always have to have people um, also reviewing what is happening and also making their own call, I think. And that's what Babylon 5 can show so so wonderfully because there is no completely complete fail safe. Um and, and yeah, about about about, about the, the the flaw that I learned in school that we cleaned up it was that our president, Bundespräsident, before World War Two was elected in person directly by the people. And that was always marked as this big flaw and I still don't get why we marked that as the big flaw. But that's another discussion. That's a discussion about <laughs> Weimar Republic constitutional law, yeah. which maybe goes beyond what we can say here. But I mean, what you're saying is completely right. And this is also where the discussion of mini packs becomes so difficult because there isn't a completely idiot proof system. And we look at something like mini packs, and it's very easy to make the comparison to Stasi and say it's a very bad idea because that's a very bad uh, agency that existed in a terrible regime. But at the same time, Internal security agencies aren't a crazy dystopian idea. We have one right now, and it's not idiot-proof. The Verfassungsschutz has put 
so many people in Nazi circles who turned out to be actual Nazis. It is really bad. It's a big problem. So, but it, it, it just goes to show just establishing an agency like this isn't inherently a road that leads to ruin. It's something that is necessary to some degree. And if they just present themselves like this, it can ran, r raise so many red flags, but at the same time. Yes. Uh, the important parts are usually how they do their job and who are the ones who make the decisions and control this system. If, if there is something of of course you can you can go in circles with this if if the control system isn't working and stuff like that because yeah like you all already said there is no completely safe system but you can at least try to make it in a proper way and think of certain things that would destroy uh, the the system or turn the system into something really really dark Yes, and I think no matter what kind of agency or system you work for, no matter who you work for, you're always kind of in the responsibility to look out for what are they ordering to do and at which point do you just have to make a decision for yourself. I it doesn't always have to be super dramatic, of course. It can also be minor things where you just say, I don't stand behind this, I don't do this. Ironically, I think what makes many packs and by extension Nightwatch so dangerous is how much of a grassroots movement it is, how little outright authoritarian elements there are, because this guy doesn't come on board of the station and tells people, this is a thought crime, and anybody who does this should be arrested right now, which would be, you know, the very overt evil way. What he's saying instead is, just look around your neighbors, and if somebody does something suspicious that you yourself think might be an issue, just report it. He's extremely vague about everything. He doesn't give you a very clear charter, which always should ring a, a lot of alarm bells. It's not that there is, you know, a text of law, a legal document that you can refer to. So in theory, if somebody gets reported, could appeal to this before a court and get a definitive decision. It's just vaguely telling people, oh, you can be in a position of some authority and you will just... Decide on your own whim what is right and what is wrong, which is the perfect recipe to saw a lot of distrust and division and get yes, a lot of the, dirt on everyone. Distrust and division is also a thing because what I think is a red flag here is that it just invites citizens and not just people who are already working in security, but all kinds of citizens to spy on their neighbors. And for example, in discussions, in discussions here in Germany, It is even it is even a divided discussion about whether it's okay if people make it a hobby to go through the street and report people who park their car wrongly, because the police in general does not always encourage to spy on your neighbors and report that, because that does something to a society. Of course, you are to report a crime, or if someone you know is in a kind of an emergency, you help or you call someone. That's a different thing. But just going through and you know reporting every mistake you see that someone can get fined for it is frowned upon. On because it does something to your society. It divides it in a critical way. I mean, the big discussion about this is always like vigilante justice. Like you don't want uh, your local HOA to start building its own militia and persecuting people because then you very quickly get into issues uh, where it becomes no longer legally bound by anything. Yeah. And of course, if you have people running around and taking a look in the neighbor's um, window, you get you start constructing a really paranoid society because you you have no i know this is the wrong construction for this word but it, it, overall it it describes the the whole thing the best a safe space doesn't mean of course you shouldn't do things you're not allowed to but like i don't know the little stuff where where we we controlled with everything like yeah you, you drop you drop a little bit of paper on on the floor um then if if immediately someone comes out and, and calls you out for that if this happens with everything you do this is this is yeah like 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 terrorism to your to your mind because you're always on on the lookout you never leave this this yeah flight or fright state um, and 
yeah, if you do this to a whole society, um, it, it just breaks at some point because this is not a state of mind you can keep on holding on the long term without, yeah, deeply harming the people. I mean, this brings us full circle to this whole discussion. We've seen in Babylon 5 time and time again that any kind of societal system only works if you trust in people making the right decision at the right point. And of course, it's worth arguing for the fact that there should be checks and balances, that a system should be built in a way that it accounts for people making mistakes. But if you take this fundamental idea away, if you don't trust anybody, if everyone is assumed to be guilty from the beginning and make mistakes, like you say, it's it breaks down immediately because then the only solution is to build a system that is so rigid and so authoritarian that it doesn't leave room for any mistakes. And that's where you get. We are in 1984 with that description. Yes. Definitely, yes. Um... So now, should we start talking about somebody who makes definitely a lot of mistakes in this episode? <laughs> Sheridan. Oh, yes. And Natalia, you want to. Oh, yes. Um, I do like the slime ball of mini packs that we get because i feel like with everything he says there is this outwardly nice message but also very subtle hints and threats at everything for example what really stuck with me on this watch is that he talks about talia or talks to her and he talks about how you know everything is already arranged with her superiors back home which is just a subtle reminder that talia you are not part of babylon 5 you are not part of this crew sheridan is not your immediate superior and he cannot protect you because you are part of Psycho, which is back home, which is with me, which leaves so very little room to maneuver in, in any direction. And I think this is something that this guy probably excels at and is part of the reason why he's giving these TED Talks, because he has this wonderful way of telling people how bright the future is going to be with just enough reminders of why they do not have an ability to speak up against this, to, to have this threatening aura around him. Thing um did not, came to my mind because I was talking about things <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, one of our basic needs is safety, hmm. um, and it, it's it's a tight rope. You you need enough, um, like enough enough things that make give you the impression of being safe. Like uh, I know there's a police. But if I see them too often, I have in the back of my mind, oh, there might something might have happened or something might be happening. And therefore, I reduce the safety feeling again. And this is exactly uh, this is happening if you implant li something like this, this yeah, night watch system or where, where people are constantly watching you because this over safety is taking away the feeling of being safe. And on top of that, you can add that there's also a real threat level there, which ironically is self, self-perpetuating, self where you can very rightly say, listen, human society is having some issues internally, like there's terrorists groups running around and, and weird conspiracies happening and people of the military industrial complex smuggling like classified weapons around. We really need an internal security service. It's just... Unfortunately, these terrorist groups are home guard, which are on the same side as mini packs, which is really bad. Yeah, but I want, also wanted to um, say something to this safety problem Michael just mentioned, because we have already compared this to the Stasi, Staatssicherheit, State Security in history. And um, because you also mentioned that um, um, in this paranoid, paranoid state, people just tend to break. But these kind of systems um, always play with this feeling of safety or not being safe or being watched. Because if I remember correctly, a practice the Stasi often used was to be watched. And of course, when you told your friends or your family about that, they thought that you were going crazy and that you were paranoid because there was no reason to believe that. And that is also this kind of this kind of paranoia such a system likes to imply, uh, like likes to put people through and to use, of course. I mean, this is why Stasi agents or at least, you know, some divisions of them are hilariously bad at their disguises because the point is, yes, officially you don't want to be seen, but at the same time you want people to know that you're shadowing them at some point. Like, this is part of the psychological effect of it. Yeah. So I think overall we implemented really well 
how dangerous this whole shithole of uh, the Night Watch and Mini Park can get. Um, and why it's so difficult to put a stop to it at this point because it's so slippery. And what do you what do you remember? What was Talia's decision? Because I don't remember. I think there was no presented decision. She we don't need her. She was just there. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think she really has much of a choice in this. If Psycho says jump, she has to jump. Yeah. Or she has to completely break off with them, which at this point she wouldn't do. But maybe it's interesting before we move on, because we should move on, but maybe for one thing to remember, it is fairly new that we even know that we have uh, uh, our uh, telepath. Mm. We have only discovered them very recently as humanity. And not all societies have telepath. And I think with this development that we see here, um, there is definitely, I mean, I, at this point when I watched the show, I could not grasp it yet. I could not say what is the meaning of the telepath, but I definitely felt like there was a deeper meaning because having telepath and having this development in society on Earth feels like a match that is too perfect. Hmm. I don't know, you tell me. Yeah, there was just an idea I had back then when I watched it for the first time. Maybe I would just like to put that here for now. I mean, there's, you know, if people are already paranoid about who might be a telepath or not, the opportunity to put on a Nightwatch armband and report people you think might be telepaths is just very appealing because now you get paid for it as well. And, you know, this is this is why you have psychops running around and always warning you that, you know, you never know if somebody is a rogue telepath who might steal your secrets. If we're talking about instilling paranoia in society, that's just a golden opportunity. Absolutely. And, you know, and of yeah, course, an opportunity to rat people out just because you don't like them. Yeah. And, you know, the whole idea of a thought crime becomes a lot more tangible once you have telepaths in the mix. It's, it's, it's an interesting yeah, thing. Totally, totally. I mean, and then it also becomes much easier to, to mellow things out and say, hell, not every, and I mean, he does this in his speech, hey, not everyone who is going to be reported and taken away in a bus is going to be a bad person necessarily. Some people just don't know any better or maybe they were manipulated into things like that. So you can even better justify persecuting people even if, you know, it's a beloved family member because you can always say, well, it wasn't really their fault. It's just, you know, for the good of the people I have to report them now. So, well, good point uh, to get uh, to Mr. Morden. And I, I would say we, we, we start with his um, appearance or maybe maybe sh something we should at least mention um, is in the beginning that we have a lot of refugees from, um, I don't know, non colonies or at least yep. from the non um, uh, people are arriving on B5 and yeah, well, they are. Most of them are, are hurt, some are hurt really bad, some almost dying. And um, yeah, they're kind of, as, as Zach phrases it, they're swamping um, B5 to a point where they no longer know what to do with them. So yeah, I love that the, the conflict is getting really, really bad and B5 is in direct um, yeah, contact with this. I, I love the fact that this is our introduction to this episode and it's basically told to us, hey, listen, we have a massive refugee crisis going on. There's just an endless amount of injured people coming in and we can't really help them. And this is not what the episode is about. You just kind of have to sit with this idea and accept that, yeah, that's what's happening, but there there is no solution to this. There is no way of making this better. We can, you know, to the best of our ability, try and help the injured and then send them off to other non colonies which are probably then gonna get conquered as well and then the same people just arrive here again it's just this vicious cycle but yeah you, you just kind of have to sit with that unfortunately yes it's just your your kind of dark status quo that for now you have to accept because you cannot do anything about the bigger problem maybe now that you've mentioned the refugee crisis for a moment um can we put sheridan still back for a moment and talk about something else that fits to this i think yes. because in this episode, I hope, the conversation that Ivana Van Franklin had about foundationalism. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, that confused me. Uh, yes, I would like to talk about that um, 
because I think it's a big thing. It tells us a lot about Franklin, and it it is it is a huge revelation about him and also about how how she, what humans do spiritually at the moment. Sure. And for me personally, and I mean this is already a bit of a, a bit of a strong opinion, but for me, if someone approaches me and suddenly asks me about my belief in God, like on a on a on a work break, and then introduces me to this new religion that has only been around for 100 years, that's a major red flag for me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I grew up very religious, so maybe that's neither there. Therefore, I'm very careful with that, but it's a major red flag if someone does that, I think. So what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, like I like I already said, I was really confused. I, yeah, I, I didn't really understand what he was trying to say. Um... Yeah, of course, it's it's bad. People are dying, and and if you see people dying, that does something really horrible to you. Especially, I I could think um as as a doctor because you became usually I would assume um, or most of the times you become a doctor to help people, and seeing you failed, um, is of course something um where where you yourself your identity maybe um your beliefs or whatever crush with the reality but um yeah I, I i didn't really get what his point was especially in context of uh this whole religious thing but maybe that's just my personal problem because religious is is yeah yeah i might, have, thing. <laughs> I might have the same problem because i grew up very religious but i'm absolutely an atheist so i'm also always sitting there with what are you trying to tell me but I think we can maybe break it down a little bit and try to understand him because he is introducing Ivanova to this religion that, I mean, the the, the basic the basic idea is to 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 realize that all the big earth religions have have a core in common, and this core is super difficult to to grasp because the idea of God is bigger than what a human mind can can grasp. Is that kind of? Yes. Yeah. I mean, maybe before or gone. Um, but then I think he says that in this moment, before someone dies, when he looks into their eyes, he sees God. So he sees this undefinable thing. So I, I think there's layers to this that maybe we want to unpack. Yeah. The first layer, I will say just in Franklin's defense, the guy has slept six hours in the past 31 he is not okay. The, the entire thing is in the context of Ivanova telling him, my guy, you can't just take stims all the time. I don't care how good of a doctor you are. Just get some sleep. You're not useful like this. And okay, this is after he slept, but he is still like, if he's not making sense, I will just chalk this up to him being sleep deprived and in a terrible state. So I, he's probably not in the best condition to tell people about the deep philosophical implications. Um, then what you just described, we, we very much have this idea, hey, there's a new religion around, but not because some weird guy had visions about UFOs and decided to start a cult, but legitimately we had first contact with aliens and that did something with spiritual life on Earth, which I, as an idea, find very interesting that this is something that, of course, people would react to. And honestly, the way it's described, foundationalism reminds me most of the vague allusions to faith that we get in something like Dune with the Orange Bible, where you have this like distilled version of old earth beliefs that are kind of mixed up together in this this weird combination of, you know, Eastern and Western traditions that 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 just kind of comes together there. And then, you know, when you do that and ask somebody, can you summarize this amalgamation of all major religions in like one sentence? Then you get something as vague as saying, well, it's basically God is too big to describe. Eh, which doesn't really tell you anything. Um, when it comes to him talking about, I can see the face of God in the dead patient's eyes. I don't think this is something that foundationalism necessarily says. This is just him personally talking about that. And I guess also saying like, yeah, I can't, I could describe to you what I'm seeing. I can only, you know talk about the situation and this makes it weird and cryptic because there is no language for me to express what this is mm, maybe to to these yeah fusion of of religions i mean this uh, 
it sounded a bit like yeah this this is like a, a fantasy or right. science fiction thing which isn't uh there are people practicing several religions because they came to the conclusion we have so many things in common um therefore why not combine it it can't be like it can't be wrong mm. um interestingly at least it feels like this to me i'm not sure if this is correct but it feels to me like this is uh something that is re comparably strong in uh like like india like like the the um regions where you have like hinduism mm. um for those maybe who want to dive a bit into this um a life of pi is a really good thing not the the movie the movie <laughs> is like like this little crumpet of what the book is um and there we have the protagonist with who is um hinduist who is christian and uh, i'm sure i'm pronouncing it wrong in english muslim 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 Muslim, um, and he's practicing all of the three of these religions. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of um, texts you can read uh, additionally that explain this whole idea. And if you go this down this road, you will find people that are, yeah, going in this in, in the in reality, not in a book, but in reality in this direction. Therefore, this is just feels like it like there were yeah presented here like okay there's just this idea that a few people had that is just getting bigger um and more in in the in the idea of yeah we are like for me we are like all humans um maybe the the same train uh that uh like yeah star trek um went way too far but um like like the realistic approach mm. of what like um Hum, more harmon harmonious um, living together would work. Yes, and I mean this also at least how Franklin explains it to us if he really just explains it as this very new religion. Um, mm. Even though it has been, it has been, uh, it is a thing that is much older, that this became more important in contrast to understanding ourselves as humans um, um, meeting other aliens so that that was kind of an attempt to see we as humans have much more in common than we thought because now there are all of these other worlds that are super strange, which is an interesting thought. Also, it could be problematic, but at first it's interesting. Um, Funnily enough, um, the, I, there is um, like the, the first science fiction, um, or, or yeah, in, in the, the first science fiction book, they usually concentrate that if you have a conflict between humans and aliens, it's the difference hmm. that's making the problems. Funnily enough, after some time, this changed that the things that they had in common were starting to become the problem. So all everything just thing of perspective there. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, where were we? Actually, talking about the Franklin's faith it being relatively new, talking about how this might spring up in a world where we've just made contact with aliens, which I, I think is is a very interesting concept because, yeah, you have this, this tension between the differences and similarities between aliens. Like, as soon as humans meet aliens, huge swaths of, you know, the belief system about how important humanity is in the grand scheme of things obviously become challenged now. At the same time, as soon as the first human talks to Mimbari and they also have this idea of souls, suddenly this part of religion gets massively boosted once again. Because if two different species in different worlds come up with the same idea, it just lends so much more credence to that being a universal concept that has some validity to it. Yes, in general, um, what you said, I mean, without without spoiling any, giving any spoilers, but... Um, to, to question how much of this really is something only humans have in common or how much how much we can have in common with other alien cultures is a topic that I think is hinted at here because of course, as we know the show already, this is an important question always. So that's definitely an interesting point. Anything more on foundationalism in general or can I say anything, something more about Franklin that has always bothered me in this episode? Sure. 
Because go on. I could be very biased and very stupid, and sometimes when it is about the spiritual things, I try to be super rational and super, also also to, to also um, be very very uh, 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 unfair <laughs> to certain uh, uh, um, uh, things. But um, I find it very problematic. Although he's tired and although he's sitting there with Ivanova in not really the best state of mind, he's still a doctor um, that wants to go back to work. And that he tells me that of this moment when a patient is dying, when he looks into their eyes as this moment where he sees God, however I twist and turn it, I find that I would not have trust in such a doctor, actually, because... Um, um, there is this whole thing that we have we have already uh, give, uh, addressed his, his God complex that he might have, that he shows sometimes, several times. But what I also find problematic is I would expect from a doctor to have on these things as life and death this very rational view. You don't have to be the super rational, atheistic person to be a doctor. But if I if I try to, to understand what happens inside of me when I look into the eyes of someone who's dying... I would um, also to make the right decision for the patient. I would expect him to know and to reflect this based on what I know about the brain and how the brain works. And we, for example, we have already now, and this is a few hundred years in the future, we have already now extensive research on, for example, where all of these funny brain phenomena come from that we associate with death. Something like that you, that you right before you die, you see yourself from up above or you see all your life as a, as a film or something. And we could even through brain scans... Um, and discover how just activity slowly dies in the brain and therefore you have all these kinds of phenomena. And a doctor who then just in these crucial moments of a patient just goes into the spiritual um, layer, um, I find that problematic. Although I know that he has all of the scientific knowledge, of course, because he is a doctor. But this point of view, I, as a patient, I would not have trust in a doctor like Franklin. I Do I get this right that you... To you, this is more like, like, yeah, h him having a power position, like I see God, I am able uh, to see God in this moment. That is one aspect. The other aspect is to not reflect about this moment with all of the medical knowledge that he should have about how the brain and dying and whatever works. The teacher yeah. does not mention that at all as an aspect. Okay. Um, what? M maybe I'm too friendly to Franklin here. But what I see, uh, or how I would translate his pompous words, uh, is that in this moment where where a person dies, this this I see God in their eyes um, is for me like him realizing, okay, there ends my power. This is above me. I can't do anything at this point to save these people. Like there's there's a there's a limit. There's something I, even I, have to bow down to. I would maybe see this, and maybe also, um, it's a bit of an explanation for himself, um, to protect himself. Because if you get to the point, I wasn't able to save this person. I did a shitty job here you get to a point where you can't do your job as a doctor. So this, these are the two points I would see or maybe want to see in this really fancy way of, of um, phrasing this. Yes, I, I, to that, <clears throat> I totally see that. Um, as I said with this topic, I'm often I reduce things that sound to spiritual to very absurd, absurd cause. I am known for that. Um, I totally see that it would still make me run from him as a doctor, basically. I would say this this says all the makings of a pretty good community question, how we would interpret Franklin's view of, of this moment, because I feel like there's one perspective that tries to rationalize or would expect a more rational mind from him. There's one that might be, you know, maybe it's a power trip, maybe it's uh, more favorably thought, the, him understanding where his power ends. Personally, for me, it it ties back into the foundationalism that if for him the central theme of his religion is not being able to define God, this almost sounds like he's trying to fill every time a patient dies under his hands with this 
tiny little glimmer of meaning that at least somehow this glimpse brings me closer to God. No matter which of these interpretations is real, I totally get this idea that this would make you run because not because it's a flaw of Franklin's necessarily, in my opinion, but it shows for me this guy is not dealing with all the death he's around very well. The, he is on his way to some kind of psychological break because he feels this need to talk about making sense of just the amount of death that he is surrounded by. That is that is not good. And if it's not a problem now, because Ivanova managed to get him to sleep for once, it's going to be a problem relatively soon. So there's definitely something there that should be addressed because he should not feel this need in this context to, to talk about it in those terms. Maybe one last thing before we finally get to Gordon. <laughs> um, one thing I would hold in uh, good regards for, for Franklin is that at a later point when he is talking to Sheridan, um, he is saying that, um, I try to phrase it as, as close as possible, we have this silly notion that we can fix everything. Well, we can't. And honestly, I, this was so far for me one of his best lines because it shows, yes, he does at least know. He is not maybe able, uh, able to, to feel uh, this uh, thing, but he, at least in his brain, has the knowledge, okay, I can't save everyone. I mean, of course, you can say, yeah, the big talk for him, saying that he's not everyone. <laughs> Um, but I think we, we should count, take it as a, as a good count for, for Franklin to, yeah, see this and count him in on this problematic. If, so if I was going to be mean to Franklin, I would say he, he only realizes this in the context of saying, I can't be everywhere at once. This is why I can't save everyone. <laughs> I am still God and untouchable, but I'm just one person. But no, I think you're completely <laughs> right that there is some level. And, you know, maybe it, we saw him, like, get a big bump to his ego in the episode Believers, and since then, things have only steadily gone worse. So, you know, there, there might be this idea that he is learning on the side that things maybe aren't as cut and dry as he as he once thought, and there's definitely some good advice that he can give uh, Sheridan out of this. Now, if we move over to, to the Mr. Morton plot... We are round about at the one hour mark, so we are, we are doing well with this. I had completely <laughs> forgotten about the religious talk in this, but I mean, it is an interesting topic. Um, there is one glimmer of light in this otherwise fairly dark episode, or, you know, not very happy episode. And that is, we will have now an entire plot line of people not being able to deal with Mr. Morden. But on Babylon 5, there is one person who knows how to deal with Mr. Morden, and it is Veer. And he does it so well in this introduction <laughs> scene where he just doesn't give a shit about Mr. Morden and is the only one so far who is entirely unaffected and unimpressed by the question, what do you want? And just has such a beautiful answer to it. So, Micah, I, I watched this and I was gleeful <laughs> because I knew you would love it. Yes, we gross to completely new heights for me. I really loved him um, because he is given more than what I wanted to give this piece of shit the whole time. <laughs> Honestly, him, uh, uh, let's start with this, um, this where he arrives and Morden says, uh, asks him to sit. And usually this would, would be, it, it, it feels in this moment like usually everyone would, would have sit down, but we doesn't. And he also does it just reluctantly when yeah, Morden like almost commands him to sit, which kind of feels to me like he has no power over beer. Yes. And we might and... talk about why that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. And uh, of course he is more than asking a uh, beer, what do you want? And Veer is answering, but I think this is more like, I want to tell you what I want because I want to, to, to go away, to, to die, just get out of my life. And yeah, of course, the best thing is after they're finished talking, we are leaving. Oh, and Mr. Morden. 
the Please fact not. that he has the courage to like give yeah. one more on on Mr. Morn is so nice to see. Also, we already have seen that Veer has really tough backbones. I mean, with the um, techno mages, um, of course he he was scared, but to go beyond your own fears, and I mean, he, he goes there a second time. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, what? Uh, it, it it's one thing to to beat fear. But if you know what is expecting you and beat fear again, that's the real shit. And yeah, Veer is doing this glamorously. So yeah, um, and everyone who is not on my little Veer uh, fan boat, <laughs> I don't like you. There aren't <laughs> very many people out there that don't like Veer. I'm pretty it's sure you are. Had, just had to say that I, I don't live with opinion, people but... like that. I don't want to know people that are like that. <laughs> I think it just goes to show that Veer is really embracing this position of being the second after Londo, where if that's your job, nothing will scare you. You are already in the deepest shit imaginable. He already made a deal with the devil that you are inevitably tied to. You already know that your fate is somehow connected to Londo because both of you are going to be emperor at some point. I, I think he's legitimately in this point where the question, what do you want, doesn't hold any power over him because there is nothing that Vir would want, especially from this guy. There is no illusions of power, no like wishful thinking about the reality of the Centauri Republic or anything like that. Vir knows what he is and where he is, and he's just not interested in receiving any more favors from anyone. Yes, but I don't think it's just that he's in this position where he does not have any any of these typical future scenarios in mind anymore. I also think that this common common response that Mr. Morden was able to trigger in people, um, that they give him this dirty little secret of a of a, of a, of, a, of a kind of victory that they would like. That is just something that for a person like Revere is just not on his list. I don't think even if he was in another position, he would be the kind of person who would give him a super weird power scenario in which he would like to be on top. That just doesn't suit him. And I think this is also so wonderful that Babylon 5 shows us this. We now see the Centauri mostly as one party in this brutal war where someone like Mr. Morden can catch a lot of people. And um, we still have someone who is part of that species of that culture who just doesn't work like that and who it just doesn't work. Yes. And that is wonderful. We still see the individual here. And especially on the side, which, you know, ostensibly, especially the last few episodes, has been well established as the bad guys of the war. And you know, it also makes things a little more complicated because any time, you know, the battleship of the Centauri blows up in front of the station, you kind of want to cheer for it. But on the other hand... Not all of them are just the ruthless monsters, just as much as all the non and ruthless monsters. So it is still a tragedy that this civilization is involved in everything, that the scale of the conflict is so big that it encompasses everyone, even somebody like Veer. Now we have somebody like Sheridan, who I don't think we, we consider a bad guy, but he is very much susceptible to Mr. Morden's power because there's something that he very much wants. I never saw it that way. N me neither. I, I mean, okay, may maybe then I bring in a very unusual perspective. Maybe I've watched the show too many times, so all the normal ways of watching it have are lost on me. But I do think that this entire getting captured and getting interrogated by Sheridan. I mean, the way Dylan talks about it later on, it was very, very close for be to being an, a very big win for Mr. Morden. I think, in a way, this is Mr. Morden still getting his answer from somebody that he approached about what do you want, just in a little bit more of an unconventional way. You mean that he wanted to get caught, and that Sheridan's going against all of the rules is uh, is the effect Mr. Morden has on him. I think the... Not necessarily, and I, I don't like to think of Mr. Morden as having like a magical effect on people or telepathic effect on people. 
but I think he's still doing the same thing. Like when he goes around the first time and asks people, what do you want? What he's doing is basically annoying everyone to a point where they break and then spill the beans, tell them his dirty little secret, go over the bounds of what would be normal for them and just lay out their power fantasy, what it would be. And for Sheridan, this is at some point, if you push my buttons correctly, I don't care anymore what this is going to mean for my career or for my people or for the system or for the ideals that I swore on. I want my wife back. I will not stop on this. I will give in to the paranoia of being a conspiracy head and, you know, go to any lengths necessary to make that happen. And I think under any other circumstances, this is a personality that Mr. Morden would likely use. This is kind of the same susceptibility that Londo fell prey to, where he was like, I ultimately don't care about myself. I want the Centauri Republic back in power, whatever it takes. And now we see where that's gotten him. Yeah, I definitely see that point. Maybe if you bring that up right at the start, maybe we should now jump to the conversation that Sheridan has with Delenn and with um, Kosh. Yes, it's another big Kosh episode, actually. Yes. I have to say, I really like that scene where Delenn just introduces uh, uh, Sheridan to, to, to this old conflict and to the first ones. And only one is left, and you just have this moment of wondering who that might be. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is a it is a pretty big reveal, and I I don't mind starting with that because ultimately this is what the story is about. And I was gonna ask Mike for impressions on that, but if you want to go. Yeah, because yeah, maybe because the, what, what what I wanted to talk about here was um. What you said that it looked like a very big win for Mr. Morden. Mm. So um, let's maybe look at the warning Dylan is giving Sheridan mm. of why he has to let Mr. Morden go. Because so far, we don't know who he is there for, who he is working for. But now we have. <laughs> um, well, I'm I'm not really sure. How and in, in, in what degree this is, or to what degree this is intended to, what could be the purpose? Um, because for me, there are just too many um, variables here that uh, are not really, yeah, to determine. It's it's like he could have wanted this uh, and even go to a point of okay now i i push it to to the point of where the whole shadow war um let's let's call it that breaks out or did i want just did he want just to to test uh the ropes or was it wasn't it in, uh, it, uh, intended at all i i and I'm, I'm not really sure because yeah there there are moments where he Looks like he is really annoyed. Like I want to leave, and technically he could just kill him, or or I don't know. Mm. He he has his his uh, creepy shadow spiders with him that could do the job in one way or another. Um, so yeah, I I, I don't really get his in, intention here, or if this is just yeah shit happens even to him. I mean, um, what the maybe one thing the uh, maybe I was just too focused on the writing part because this goes all to the end where Sheridan uh, walks to Kosh and tells him, yeah, well, what we did so far was cute and everything, but now I want you to teach me to fight these things, and uh, so that I can go to uh, Zahadum the the place where all these creepy guys hang out and where my wife was killed um and i want to take them down even it or a lot of them even if it costs me my life and that that was a bit yeah a, a bit of a boring moment for me because it's it's again it's it's like yeah wh why do does he have to have a personal connection there Hmm. 
because the, his motivation to fight these shadows is revenge because you fuckers killed my wife and i don't know it, it um it, it's a trope i don't don't like that much maybe it's just in in this constellation because there are really good revenge plots out there but at this point it was like yeah oh yeah again he has to be involved personal because otherwise there would be no way uh he would be motivated enough to get through with all this and yeah i i it, it feels like there's always needed um or most of the times need a dark motivation um of of course that to uh, to die yourself or or that the humanity or the half of the universe is wiped out is also a dark motivation but a dark personal one like revenge or stuff like that mm. I'm, i'm not sure how much i like this they are multiple points that you just made so maybe let's 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 roll them up one after another if we want to open the real can of worms about the whole does mr morden want this or not we can ask ourselves the question how much of a mr morden is there really because it's you know from the backstory that we get with dylan it's perfectly viable to say Mr. Morden doesn't really exist. He's just a meat suit that the, the shadow spider crap things use to interact with other people. Perfectly viable can be. On the other hand, you could also assume Mr. Morden is a person who made this decision on Zahra Doom, and when he says, I'm talking to my associates, he is literally talking about the fact that Mr. Morden is a person who might be very annoyed about being imprisoned, for example, but he represents the shadow people who might very much want him to be there and reveal this, because in the grand scheme of things, I, I don't think there's a lot of doubt about the fact that the shadow people as a whole would want him to be bait and would want others to you know hunt them down and show their hands before they're ready because then they in, they win the war easily so that's just good for them maybe before you go to another point what i would um consider an argument for mr morden existing as mr morden in in some way at least is this um that delenn is saying um, that these, um, that the, the, the people from the Icarus, where Sheridan's wife also was with, um, that they were asked, like, you can serve us or you die. And if you have to make this, this like, yeah, kind of, you agree to do this, I'm not sure how much sense it makes to reduce Morden just to a meat suit. Because if you if you don't need an, like like an agreement like help, then you don't have to ask. Then you, you could just go. Yeah. So one, two, three. Yeah, we have three new meat suits, and we can go out and do our stuff. I mean, then that, theoretically, there also wouldn't be a reason to wait for a ship to crash there, right? Like, why just not build your meat suit from crash? But to to maybe add a caveat there, what Dylan talks about here is a big revelation. I still would always keep in mind she's talking from the perspective of someone who's learned most of these things through prophecy. I don't know how much of this is the Mimbari adding meaningfulness and religious things into this that you, who knows how much of that is yeah. there. Well, I would, I would give this legit because Kosh is standing beside her. <laughs> yes, he walked there and if if there was something like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Even though he is, uh, we considered him most of the time a troll, I would think that at least at this point, he would try to somehow put it right. And he gives this like vision to Sheridan. Yeah. Therefore, yeah, but, but, I, would, but would he necessarily? Because we have just learned that he was on one side in this big ancient war. And that the Membari know most of the things from their close contact to, to him, right? And he gives Sheridan this this vision. And um, I mean, we have no no reason to believe that the Volons or Kosh are in any way manipulative or or whatever. But they are definitely one side in a very old and ancient 
brutal war. That's what we have learned. And um, I would not definitely 100% rely on Kosh only giving us the pure facts of everything just from this fact. I mean, the Wardons are the guys who blew up the immortality serum because they decided that's not okay. So there's definitely an element to they have their own agenda and that's not always floofy and positive. And we just don't know what kind of agenda that is yet, but we can also always put that a little bit in question at some point, I think. Funny thing would be if the uh, Volons are also bad and then just sweep everything down when they have the right point. I feel like we'll get to know that at some point. <laughs> but it's going to be a great time for Sheridan if he turns around and learns, oh, by the way, I was betrayed by Kosh as well. And then just like on one of his lessons, gets stabbed in the back. But we have a very, very sad end to the story. Um, but yeah, on, 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 on the note of Sheridan, the, the, the big question on the writing here, um, I, I think it's perfectly safe to say giving somebody a dead family member as a motivator is a well-trodden path and I can totally see why somebody wouldn't be super enthused about this. My read on this though is I don't think the show introduces Sheridan's dead wife here as a motivation to go to Zaha Doom, like as a motivation to fight the shadow people, right? Because I think the show has done a lot to show us Sheridan was fighting against the Membari, Sheridan has always tried to do the right thing here. Sheridan is an idealist to the point where he's even suspicious of his own government because he wants genuinely the good for humanity. And I don't have any doubt that if this personal connection wasn't there, he wouldn't still be fighting for that. I think the, the personal vengeance is a reason for him to make mistakes in that, though. I think course, this is for us to justify. Street. Yeah, so far he's been smart about fighting. I, he's been smart about blowing up the Black Star and not blowing up the next Mimbari ship that came to the station because that would have triggered a war. I think this is a little bit to show us why would Sheridan go off the rails? Why would Sheridan get to a point where it becomes dangerous with Mr. Morton and not step back and realize, man, this guy has connections to every government in the galaxy. That's suspicious. I shouldn't be messing with that. And for that personal mistake, adding the personal stakes... I think it's a little bit more justified because I would have a harder time seeing him being so passionate about something as intangible as the fate of the galaxy. Yes, yeah, of course. Maybe, maybe this is just my my broken literary mind that is uh, <laughs> just like, oh, isn't that convenient? Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, my brain just works like that. But maybe we can summarize the big reveal that we've had in this scene. Maybe we can summarize what we've learned about the situation in the galaxy so far. Because through all of the season, and that can easily be forgotten because we have this big actual conflict, we have the big war going on, and we have the situation on Earth. But we also have been getting constant warnings, for example, by, 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 um, by oh my god, names. By Jakar. Mm. And Sheridan even mentions him that Zaha Doom is this place Jakar has been warning everyone about. And now we get this big reveal of something bigger, something older, something ancient, something older than all of the recent races mm. going on in the galaxy. And there's this this old war. And I think that is a very big reveal. And that um, what I find interesting here is that now we have two layers. We have one layer that is the very actual recent politics. And I think also Sheridan getting his hands on Mr. Morn and realizing something is off with him is completely still in, these, in this layer of recent politics. You think that he's onto a mystery that has to do with some... Some, some some kind of kind of mission of someone that something there is not right, but he completely thinks within the rules of his reality. And as soon as Delenn and, and Kosh talk to him and take him out of this, he's introduced of there's this level of mystery, this level of something that's bigger than all of us, which actually is an interesting connection that can be made to the definition that Franklin has given us. There's something so huge we cannot grasp, but we have these two layers. Yeah, he's getting there. <laughs> It's 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 kind of a scary thing because ultimately Sheridan gets what every conspiracy theorist is dreaming about, right? This <laughs> revelation that actually there is a whole different level of reality where the Illuminati are actually controlling everything and now it all makes a deeper sense, which, yeah, it's, it's on the one hand satisfying, on the other hand, I don't know how Sheridan will react to that because if he was paranoid up to this point, oh boy, is he going to go off the rails now? Like, this is... Yeah, it's, 
he, uh, with everything that happens, he's, gonna, he's just going to show up at Kosh's do doorstep and ask, Is this the shadows as well? My rent went up for my apartment. Was this the shadow manipulation? My egg tasted weird this morning by breakfast. Is the other shadows manipulating me? I, I think this could go out of hand very quickly. It could. Um, but yeah, I mean, nowadays we are very sensitive towards all of this conspiracy theories and everything, which is good. But also, if you look back in history, you just have these moments where how things actually work together sound like you are onto some something yeah. weird. And that actually sometimes is the case. So there's always two two sides to it. But yeah. Um... Now that we've talked about the, the big reveal, and I think it makes sense to start there because that is ultimately what this plot is about. How do we feel about the lead up to that, though? Because I have to say, Mr. Morden has been around since the second half of season one now. He's not had many appearances. I think this is the episode where him being established as sort of a villain figure in this show really works for me. Because up to this point, he's this weird salesman kind of guy who is like a smile, like he's making toothpaste commercials. And I just don't know where to place him. And now you just have this guy in a cell. And I, I love how Sheridan's perspective is on this. He's just connected to everything. I just put this random person in a cell and suddenly every major government of the local sector is demanding that he's free. <laughs> what the heck is going on? How is this random person this important? It makes no sense. And as a lead up to his reality breaking, I, I really enjoy that. Just there, there is this mystery that you cannot resolve just with what Sheridan knows, and he drives him absolutely mad. Not really to to uh, what you what you said, but um, the moment where Delenn and Kosh appear, uh, like yeah, you have to to release uh, more now. Um, the moment Delenn turns around, like yeah, follow me, uh, and leaves. Yeah, the the scene we see. I really love her energy in this moment because this is, after a long time, it, it feels like she has energy. Like I know what I'm doing. I like like there's there's a drive. Yes. Um, and like like yeah, she's confident again, which she was lacking most of the times in in, in the last episodes we saw her. So like, yeah, this is my purpose. That's why I'm here. This is why I've been all through all this shit. I see. Um, this is... Which is nice to see, but on the other hand, of course, really tragic to uh, have, yeah, this kind of thing as a purpose for your life. But I, I think, you know, she spends so much time now being questioned on why did you do this transformation? Isn't this horribly offensive to everyone and such? And as bad as these circumstances are, this is a little bit of this validation. I know there is a purpose behind this. It's actually the big prophecy that I believe in is real. And it is good that I'm following along with that. And Sheridan is someone no, who appreciates I can tell that. why. Yes, she can finally talk to listen, somebody. You want to listen. Yeah, that's, that's really good. We haven't seen the near in a long while. Yeah, so it's yeah cool. I just noticed. Sorry. <laughs> uh, somebody has to do the actual politicking work of being ambassador on Babylon 5, and Delenn has been a little bit preoccupied, so I'm just assuming he's out there negotiating trade treaties and stuff like that. Also, um, the way um, Sheridan discovers that there is more to Morden than meets the eye through uh, Talia, mm. um, and her reaction, honestly, she's slapping him just just that and then leaving um i i really uh yeah really lost this because yeah it's, go girl <laughs> it's very satisfying although it's still a mystery to me how the hell he keeps his job after that because for all he knows she could have been fried in that corridor like even if he doesn't know what Mr. Morden is, Mr. Morden, at the very least, could be a rogue telepath who just, you know, puts a bug in her brain and, and fries it. The, this whole action, like him going against chain of command and holding somebody in custody, you know, that's that's bad, but that's not worse than any kind of regular police corruption that you uh, see on an everyday basis. 
but him like taking one of his people and putting her willingly at risk and like forcing her into a confrontation with an unknown entity which at this point he at least knows is far more important and powerful than anything he's encountered that's that's just not okay like the these rules exist for a reason and yeah him getting off with just a slap to the face honestly as satisfying yes. as that is honestly it was just a lady slap she should not just have like this she should have just used her fist to a bit more damage come on yeah or at least you know plant the bra the image of mr morden's shadowy face in sheridan's brain as well so he wakes up sweaty at night for the next two months from this because yeah it's that is a, that is a whole weird interaction that should not be okay that's also where i lose most of my faith in zag like the <laughs> fact that he comes in and is like oh there's a random prisoner that i have to keep okay you know what he he hadn't had time to read all the reports but at least at this point he should have known like that's that's too fishy to to go through with but also it's maybe important to to keep in mind that i think that it was the first direct confrontation that mr martin had with a telepath mm. So this is their reaction. Yeah. <laughs> Another group of people he probably really can't interact with in the same way. Because as bad as this was for Talia, Mr. Morton didn't have his usual power over her. He couldn't really strike a deal in that way. Um, what I would be interested is what you think about the scene when after, after this, um, where... Sheridan and Zack are sitting in their observation room, mm. and he's telling to uh, Zack to adjust the the uh, scans or something yes. like that. And then there's this short moment where Sheridan is able to to see the shadows, um, and then he says, "Oh no, no, nothing, just shadows." And I think Zack leaves. Then he's told to release Morden, and after that, b before you have this like. Um, you see the, the most of the room where um, Morden is in and then uh, after this you see just um, a face, a close up just the face of Morden that smirks into the camera like like the, with a, with a shit eating grin like yeah I know what's going to happen Sheridan um, and I'm curious do you think um, Morden kind of knows what's happening in this room or is it just his personal anticipation of, yeah, that he is going to be free soon or, yeah, what do you think? Is it just dramatics for, for the series? Of course, I'm sure it, it's part of it. But When Sheridan does the cycling through different scanning modes, he gets to see the shadows for a moment and then they are invisible again. Which I take to mean, and I, I don't know if that is 100% what's intended, but I take it to mean the shadows notice that they are being seen in that moment and adjust basically whatever camouflage they're utilizing. So for me, this, this is kind of Mr. Mons associates telling him, listen, we've just been seen. You're going to get out here very quickly because they, they figure out that something is off and they will probably be scared of this. And this is how he... How he figures, okay, my time has come. This is great. Something is going to happen now. But that's that's just how I I would explain that. I have never actually thought about it. I've never given it any meaning, actually. Um, because I've just seen Sheridan once again looking at all of this, these images just as, just as this riddle that is there. Mm. So I don't know. I'm not sure what I would think, honestly. But I... I, I... If we are already, like, at this scene, I do have to say I love the portrayal of the shadow creatures in this scene, especially for the implication that whenever Mr. Morton is talking about his associates, they are literally there. They are these, like, massive... Yeah, there is a shadow creature right here. They are these, like, pretty big spider crab creatures that are just invisible, and you just have to imagine, okay, how do they always stay by his side? They must be incredibly, like, climbing on walls, on ceilings, like, bending over so that they fit through the doorways and just never touch anybody because they're physically there. That's just such a, a creepy image that I, I really enjoy. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if how I want to take this um, because 
of course, the uh, implication that the shadows know that they uh, were scanned or in, in, in the sense of we were scanned and we were seen. Just scanned doesn't mean, probably doesn't mean anything to them, but realizing, okay, we are, we're just now seen, um, it, it's kind of dramatic because, yeah, well, they, to a degree, they would, could assume, okay, um, we are uncovered. We have to start the war soon. So, I mean, it most definitely lends credence to this warning that Dylan gives that Sheridan is very, very close to making a massive mistake. And we can at least assume the shadows are not immediately going to pull the trigger on the whole war thing because nobody knows what they are precisely. And they, you know, they aren't worried about somebody coming on to, to Mr. Morton and at least you know, wondering who this associates might be. But, but it definitely tells us, like, yeah, they, they are probably aware of this and they are probably going to set things in motions, which just puts all that much more pressure on Sheridan. Which ultimately leads uh, to the point of, uh, yeah, okay, we have to release him, even though I wish to do otherwise. Yes. Which I, I think for Sheridan is the greatest character challenge that we've seen so far. Him getting obsessive with an idea and then having to let it go. This idea of you can't collect this conspiracy and resolve it. You just kind of have to accept the answers that you were given, even though they just create more questions and, and deal with that. One other thing, um, I kind of dislike the, his... his um whole take on the uh, enigma um in, in world war ii and that uh, <laughs> churchill was like yeah okay we uh just let this ta we, we don't have we we don't react to this uh message we just decoded and uh, get this whole town or whatever um yeah size this this land was uh, get it um yeah practically burned down with the citizens because in this moment there is no no one in immediate danger it's it's like the the ones he is he is trying to um, do justice for are already dead and if he of course if he lets morden go there will be people that will get in harm um or in in harm's way but it's not like he is he precisely know, okay, if I stop this person right now, um, there will be, yeah, like, like this, this town will be, uh, will not be crushed. I think yeah. this is. Um, I think what Micah says is interesting because, um, there is no immediate threat. Like the threat is bigger if he actually keeps Morgan and wakes up whatever he is associated with. Um, but also um, the way that he said this Coventry anecdote implies that they had all the information and had this problem that they could do nothing. And uh, with all respect, I don't think Sheridan has nearly all the information available. I know you can. I think this mostly is about how much trust he puts into Dylan at this point to try and put a positive spin on this. That like, if she tells him listen, if you provoke more than long enough, it's going to cause the Shadow War. That Sheridan's mind goes immediately to, okay, this is going to be equivalent to losing World War II, just tells you how he frames this in his mind, how bad things are going to get. And yeah, there is no immediate threat like, like the bombing of Coventry, but he takes this warning so seriously that he treats it as one, which I think is, is just interesting in, in talking about how much value he puts into the lens interpretation of things. Yeah, though I, to me, it feels kind of unrealistic. Maybe it's because I'm outside of all this, um, and therefore I have far more distance to this, or it's just my personal perspective. Though I don't think the the scale is is comparable. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's it's not. Per so good, fitting so good that you could yeah put a parallel to this I don't know I mean for me it's 
you know, this this threat of an, an ancient enemy that will try and conquer the whole galaxy, I, I think a world war is about the best historical example you could come up with. Of course, on this side, yes, but the the Coventry um, uh, the bombing it, versus yeah yeah there there is no there is no comparison on his side of um, of this storyline. Therefore, it doesn't fit to me because you can't you can't say yeah this is a parallel to this history um, yeah the historic event which is in itself a bit problematic, um, but it doesn't fit at all it's just one side that is the same and therefore it's far too much off from the original one um to to yeah put put um a comparison there for me at least a situation that sheridan himself would be much more would be in would and, and i have to phrase this a bit carefully i think but it would be like already in the late 20s or early 30s knowing the complete extent of everything the nazis are going to do which they didn't even know at that point in complete detail, but knowing all of that and just having to go with it for some fucked up reason and not being able to prevent it, that is more the situation I think Sheldon at least feels himself in, mm. although he doesn't have enough information for that as well, but that's how he sees it. So the Coventry example is a bit weird because, yeah, it's a completely different thing. I mean, it's I'm going to... Let's say that. I, I'm going to try and make make one last ditch effort to defend Sheridan here where he asks Zach and this opportunity have you ever listened to uh, you know your, your history classes so I think the implication here is that he expected Zach to listen, uh, be like yes I did and then he could bring up the Coventry example as something that was taught in school so the reason he's using this historical parallel even though it's not all that well is because it's something that people of his generation are being taught so it's just something that comes to mind which would be interesting because the the carpentry story as he tells it is very much based on one individual eyewitness account and not the historical consensus so earth alliance has some interesting selective historical teaching there as well but i think the Coventry anecdote is also just something in this version that is constant that is that is very often taught in general mm. understanding dilemma in more english speaking countries more often than in germany actually yeah. because i've seen this reference so often even in one of the sherlock movies the newer one for benedict cumberbatch the whole ending was kind of uh in 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 in, in remembrance of this coventry thing from a different angle that also feels a bit weird but i think it's more like it's culturally accepted to use that in general for a dilemma I think so. Okay, if it's if it's this kind of context, then okay. Um, it's still not a it's 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 not the best historical example you could come up with, but you know it's him talking in a moment, so fine. And so like Miss like Franklin Sheridan is the best of the spaces <laughs> in this in this area. So yeah, this episode had a lot to talk about. It does surprisingly, yeah. There's a lot of the rest for. <laughs> Mostly being about people sitting in rooms, <laughs> but okay. I think we've we've talked about it all extensively around about two hours now. So, so yes, as we end our main discussion on the topic of dilemmas and which historical references are appropriate to it, I mean Franklin did face quite a big dilemma with the whole uh, refugee crisis going on, and because this wasn't part of this episode, maybe it will be part of the next episode, which is going to be knives and. Until then, as usual, we have our community question about how Franklin chooses to interpret his dilemma with all the dead people. How how do we feel? How do you feel, our dear lurkers, about his talk of seeing God's face reflected in the eyes of the dying? Is this him on the ultimate power trip? Is this him seeing more the extent of where he just feels very helpless, where his power ends? Is it him trying to fill meaning in in the death that he's experienced, and should he be more rational about it? Is that a good summary of all the different ways that this answer might go? Um, as usual, you're welcome to comment your responses as well as anything else you would like to say under this video. But we are also on all kinds of other social media, including Mastodon, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and here on YouTube. We are the cutest because here you can see us. Thank you for watching, and until next time. Oh,